Vivian Lin. I'm a design researcher and strategist, um, formerly of Delve. Um, I am now working over at American Family in their Adjacency Holdings Venture Build Group. Delve is shorter, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Not bitter. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, uh, I'm, Wait, oh, I'm Stephanie Norvices. I almost forgot. I'm the VP of Strategy here at Delve. I've been here for 16 years. My background is in cultural anthropology, and I've been using the methods of social science to facilitate um, innovation and design for almost 30 years, which makes me OLD. Um, but I have lots of good stories. Um, so one of the things that, um, one of the stories that we have, uh, that I'd like to share with you is about my frustration. So been um, working with clients for years and years and years and uh, about 10 years ago we had this one client where we were doing it all right right we were like following the process and the team was really aligned ours and theirs and we were doing great work and everything was going great and yet we kept coming to these meetings where decisions needed to be made and we couldn't get them to make a decision and I became so frustrated um, especially when they would come to me and be like I think we need to do some more research Right? So part of me should have been like, yay, more work, more research, I love research. But the fact is, is I was like, no, you don't. Like more information is not gonna make it better. It's not gonna make it more clear. And uh, I thought we, ha we were doing it wrong, right? We must be doing something wrong um, where we can't, we, we're doing this process and we still can't decide. And so I thought we should really study decision making um, decision-making process, decision-making theory and philosophy, and use that to create some tools that can help us better facilitate decision-making. And I thought, this seems hard. And so I said, Vivian, you should do this. <laughs> and she said, okay. Um, and so um, we're gonna, um, so born out of that was a lot of research, years of research really, and conversations and presentations and workshops um, uh, where we sort of took all of that information and tried to apply it to our process. And so what we're going to share with you today is sort of a high-level look at some of the things that we learned along the way and um, share with you some of the tools, failure modes and tools that um, uh, we think can be very helpful. And then I uh, gave you all, and if you didn't get one, be sure to grab one, um, a booklet that um, is sort of the, after doing these workshops and presentations, people kept saying like, can you give us, do you have something? Can you print something out? Can you share this with us? And we said we should probably do, create something. And so we did. So we'll be sharing that with you as well today. But I'm wondering um, for how many of you have had difficulty in your personal life sort of making a decision? I cannot buy glasses without my sister, period. <laughs> Um, I have a hard time picking out a toothbrush at this point because there's so many of them. Um, and when I think about the work that we're in and the, the work, especially in the work of design and innovation, it's something that we're asking our clients to do a lot is to make a decision. And the simplest decision to the most complex decision can be confounding. Some people are sick of the term innovation, but the term innovation is often thrown around lightly, but it's actually very risky business, and it's the business that we're in. And quite frankly, it doesn't have great stats. So 95% of all product innovations fail, and 92% of all startups fail. This is the bad news. Um, however, um, the numbers also show us that innovative companies grow faster and more profitably than other companies. And this is sort of the world that we live in, right? Um, and it's the world that probably a lot of you live in as well, where you're trying to, innovation is important, it's very risky, it's likely to fail, but if you get it right, it's really good. Um, what are some failure modes? This is from a Boston Consulting Group uh, Global Innovation Survey, um, where they asked to, to um, work with different companies to identify failure modes for innovation. And um, too long development times, selecting right ideas, risk averse culture, lack of coordination, not enough great ideas, and marketing innovations. And when I look at this, this seems, matches my experience quite well. Um, and this is something that I always 
you know, again, as a design and innovation firm, this is something that we often say to our clients when we come in, maybe coming in looking to us for ideas, and we're like, there's, there's no shortage of good ideas. But the process of getting that idea, choosing one, and getting it through your organization is the, actually the hard part. And so we really believe that decision making and facilitating decision making can really alleviate some of these point, pain points, especially the top two pain points, right? Inability to make a decision can make development times very long. So we will get to a point where a client needs to make a decision, they can't, and so they put us on hold, right? Lengthening out the time. And then selecting the right idea is so hard, and that again is what this decision making um, conversation is all about. And so one of the things that I would challenge you, I've challenged myself, and a, we challenge each other here at Delve is to think that our main job, really, our job number one is to consider ourselves in the position of facilitating decision making. So if we take that seriously, that our job is to make and facilitate decisions, how would you do that differently? How would you approach a meeting differently if that was your point of view, right? Um, and it, it's an, actually a powerful hat to put on in your job when you're thinking about meetings, when you're launching a project, is how might I do things differently if really what my goal is, is to help them choose. As uh, consultants, you know, this can be especially um, relevant for our clients because the decisions that we're asking them to make are complex, they're systemic, there's no one right answer. And I want to be very clear, there is no one right answer in any of the projects that we work on. There is a handful of right answers and hundreds of wrong answers. So this, this is very hard, right? It's risky business. I've had a client come to me and literally at every meeting say, if this project fails, I'm going to be fired. I'm like, okay, like no pressure. Right? But that's the fact, that these decisions we're asking people to make, no wonder it's hard. Lots of things are riding on it, and sometimes they're jobs. So we should be very thoughtful about how we facilitate this process. Even under the best circumstances, decision making is difficult. So even thinking about getting a toothbrush or picking out your glasses, right? Um, have you ever been in a, a meeting where you've been thinking really hard all day and you're physically exhausted? Um, it actually is a, a cognitive work like that is actually a physical resource drain. It's hard work. Um, and, you know, it, it, it uses different parts of our brain. So Vivian's going to talk about that. And we're easily derailed, right? Have you ever been in a meeting where you're trying to get to a decision, you're trying to have a focused conversation, and then all of a sudden someone's just like, oh, squirrel, and all of a sudden now you're talking about this other thing, and everyone's hotly debating it, and then everyone walks out of the meeting, and you never even got back around to the topic that you were on in the first place. So squirrels happen. Um, so how do we do? How do we do this? How do we um, overcome some of these decision-making obstacles? Um, again, uh, decision-making is uh, susceptible to all kinds of different biases. There's cognitive biases. There's emotional things that happen with decision-making. There's physical things that happen with decision-making. Um, so how do we overcome these? Well, Vivian is going to tell you, has the answer to all of these questions. She's very magical. Um, or at least some of these. Um, and she's going to start out with an example. These images should look familiar to you. Before we jump into the meat of the presentation, we wanted to talk about some of the examples um, where decision making can be hard or influenced by different factors. So we asked you all to, to look at these two different Mondrian paintings and, and pick the one that you liked the most. Um, and this is drawn from a study that was looking at the effects of needing to justify your decision on the decision or in your preference. Um, so in this study, um, the references up there, um, people were asked, well, which of these two paintings do you like the most? Um, they were not designerly people. They were your average undergrads. Um, and so most people prefer the more concrete painting over the abstract Mondrian. Um, and as probably most of you are aware, depending on how you answer a question, it can push, it can push the results. So uh, people were also, a different group was asked, well, which, which of these paintings do you dislike the most? Um, and now people chose um, B. It's, 
it's the same result, right? People tend to prefer the more concrete painting, but the numbers are just slightly different, right? Um, that, that difference in the numbers um, is referred to as the, the cognitive bias framing effect. So depending on how you word your questions, you may get different answers. Um, it's uh, in, the, in the classic example, um, people's choices, um, they're asked to make a decision between a risky versus supposedly less risky example. Um, and when you put things in terms of, you know, for example, if you, if you undergo this surgery, you have an 80% chance of success. Everyone's like, yeah, 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 let's do it. But you say you're, you're going to undergo this surgery and you have a 20% chance of dying on the table. Now people are like, oh, wait a minute. And it's a different kind of decision that they make, even though it's the exact same right, out, um, options. So the lesson that we take from this um, in our work is you have to choose your words carefully. Um, a lot of this is, is probably going to seem obvious, but it's lots of obvious little details that we are trying to pull together um, and, and, and use in designing, designing a good decision-making process. So this is one of them. Um, and it's one of the things that's, that's really important to a research team. Um, and that's one reason it takes so long to create research protocols. Right? You're, you're, you're being very careful and intentional about the way you're asking questions. And oftentimes you're going to ask the question in different ways because you can see how the difference in um, wording can change the effect. Now, if we go back to that, um, if we go back to that experiment, um, the, the researcher then added this additional factor of asking people to justify their decision. So, which one of these do you like the most and why? Right? So you can think about which one you like and imagine if you had to turn to your neighbor and now explain your, your choice. So some of you in the, um, in the upon entrance, um, all of you were asked to an answer one of these questions. So we could kind of look and see how your answers matched up. Um, but, uh, so similar kind of thing, but now even more people are picking A, um, the concrete one. Um, and this is the really interesting one. So which one do you dislike the most and why? Okay, so this is interesting because now more people are saying that they dislike A. Yeah, this why? reversed their decision. That's, That's weird, <laughs> right? This is weird. So the <laughs> Now, the interpretation of this is that, again, these are undergrads, they're not art majors. The interpretation of this is that, um, oh, sorry, this was just to, this is the original results without the justification. So there's a flip in preference, okay? So um, the, the interpretation of this is that um, when people are asked to, to verbalize um, or justify um, their choices or decisions, um, they're going to focus on attributes that are easy to verbalize. So if you're uh, art naive, um, it's, it's easier to pick out things in a more concrete painting than a more abstract painting. That's the interpretation. Can I just say something about this? Yeah. This blows my mind. And when you think about the implications for our work, it's really mind blowing, right? So if you. Um, Think about it. How many times are we asking someone to make a decision where they don't have the words, they don't have the language, right? And so they might actually choose something that is not true, but only because they can talk about it. The implications of that for research and for uh, our jobs is pretty powerful. And so uh, some of the failure modes and tools that Vivian will talk about with you later address this. Um, it's a, I think this is really one of the biggest points of the presentation. Yeah. Can you share the McDonald's story? Yes. It's the same, it's the same yeah, thing. Same thing. Uh, I, a number of years ago, I was working on a project for um, McDonald's, a strategy project. And, oh. I was working on a project for McDonald's. Here, maybe I'll just do that so it's not as weird. Um, and I wasn't on this project, but they were relaying it to me. Um, I mean, I was on the project, but I wasn't on this particular project. Um, they wanted to bring pizza onto the menu. And so they took their, um, their cooks and their scientists and they developed this pizza. And they did um, some focus groups on it. And when they blind tested the pizzas compared to all of their other competitors, they won hands down as the best pizza, best tasting pizza, everybody loved it. And when they branded it, it came in last place every time. 
And so again, it's what people's expectations and perceptions, what they will allow you to do and won't allow you to do, really come into play in thinking about, again, like how people make decisions isn't quote unquote rational. There is a reason for it, but it's not maybe what we expect. So our, our takeaway is that you wanna make it easy for someone to accurately and vividly talk about a subject about which um, you want them to make a decision. So that means you know, setting the stage, that means um, giving them vocabulary, making sure you have a shared language so that you can move forward. Um, and there's, there's some interesting, there's like an interesting cluster of studies around this. Um, so if you're interested, you know, a next step is, is people comparing um, the, the preferences or judgments or decisions made by experts versus novices. And so you see that experts are less affected by this verbalization bias because they have the, the knowledge and the language and the vocabulary. So that's another kind of piece of evidence pointing towards this uh, bias effect. So, so that's an example of um, looking at the kinds of, of results that people have uncovered uh, in different um, like psychology um, tests for the most part. Um, and what we'll do is apply some of those findings to different parts of the decision-making process. So there'll be the preparation for making the decision, there'll be the deciding itself, and then there'll be the follow-up. So in preparing to make a decision, um, you know, even with great planning, things can go awry. So what we wanna do is try and mitigate um, and reduce the chances of things going off the rails as much as we can. So we're gonna talk in terms of failure modes and then things that you might be able to do or things that you should implement to try and control for those failure modes. So the first is the failure to assign roles. Um, when, when you're pulling together a group of people to make a decision, you wanna think of them as a decision-making team, right? And when you put a team together, you wanna optimize um, the players on your team. So um, the most successful decision-making teams will have a diversity of opinions, so ideally pulling people with different e roles uh, of expertise, domains of expertise. Um, you want subject matter experts, and you want to make sure there's a clearly defined decider. That's where a lot of, these, um, a lot of this step falls, I think. Um, so people have to know what their role is and how they're gonna contribute to the decision. And you'll have different types of teams. You'll have teams that maybe are not actually involved in the decision making at all, but are involved in presenting all the arguments and the reasons for and against things up to a decider. Um, maybe they, the team does have to decide as a consensus group um, and then justify up. Maybe the team is um, only providing input to one person, the project manager or whoever on that team. So it's really important to get that laid out clearly at the beginning. Another uh, failure mode is the failure to share a vision and make it explicit among all the team members. Um, this is an easy one to overlook. It's an easy one to make assumptions about. Um, but you know, a very easy kind of way to mitigate that is to create a statement of purpose. It's, you know, it's something that's got a lot of blanks that you all fill in together so that everybody you know, has to agree that they're on the same page. Um, does the team agree on the decision that you think needs to be made? Um, does the team agree that they have an ex exhaustive set of alternatives? That's when having all the different subject matter experts is, is really critical to make sure you haven't you know, left out a potential option. Um, does the team agree on the desired outcome, on the why of why you're making this decision? What are we trying to make this decision for and what do we hope that it will get us? Um, and does the team have the ability to make the decision without it being overturned? Um, that's, that's something that just more in terms of, I think, team management, process management, storytelling again, understanding um, what you're gonna need to do to get this thing to live on. Third is a failure to establish measures. Um, so if you don't have established goals or metrics, uh, people, it, it's kind of like the, the painting thing and being asked to justify. Your, with, if you don't have the tools or the language or the numbers or the different factors you want to evaluate, people are not gonna know what to do, right? You're gonna increase the processing load, uh, cognitive processing load and decrease their confidence in the process and in their own decision. Um, and that's a bad thing, because if people are not confident, it leads to reluctance to decide which I think many of you have run into. Um, it leads to second guessing the decision um, and it can lead to decision regret. Does that make sense? So a lot of th times what we'll do, we, uh, you, um, <laughs> is um, you know, really call, call out, you know, like the sliders on the left. 
these are the factors we want to consider when we're thinking about this concept um, or a set of concepts, ease of use, mass appeal, technical challenge, like really call it out, make sure everyone is evaluating on the same set of metrics. Um, and then failure to document, and this is gonna be recurring, a recurring theme. Um, the lack of story is, actually this is gonna carry forward more into the, the next two steps, but you have to remember you're creating a story and making lots of decisions along the way. You're making little decisions along the way. Um, and those things should be documented so that you can share that out and convince people and bring them along for the ride. So make a plan to document them because um, it'll help you justify your choices um, and give your team members the language and tools to justify the decision as well. So this was just a summary of what preparing for your decision-making meeting, um, what, you know, what you'll need to help um, uh, establish success. Then there's the decide already part, when you get to the meeting. Now this is a decision-making meeting where your goal is to come out with a decision or a recommendation for a decision. Um, so how do we facilitate that? What are some of the failure modes? So um, first is failure to set the stage. So we are people, we aren't robots, and we're definitely affected by our environment. Um, details in the immediate environment can actually trigger unconscious biases that affect our decision-making processes. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, some of the stories that have been out there. Um, there's an example of um, folks who were participating in an experiment and they were asked to negotiate on a car price. Um, and they had half of them sitting in hard, like on hard benches when they had to do these negotiations. And then half of them sat on really plush, comfy chairs. And it's crazy, but the people on plush, comfy chairs were actually more flexible or more, more willing to raise, raise the amount they were willing to pay for this used car than the people on the hard benches. Like they took a hard line in the negotiations. Little things like that can affect your group and the decisions that they make. Um, so make people comfortable, give them breaks throughout the day so they, their brains have a rest. Um, let them know what the timing is. Having an agenda, again, very simple, straightforward thing, but it's important so people understand when, to, when their brains have to be on and when they can turn, you know, take a break, um, and that'll help them focus. There's failure to provide thinking tools. So this gets to a little bit to you know, how you take notes and how you document. Um, so we really want to try and capture two aspects of, of how people think. You want to capture their, their gut instinct, because um, again, if you've got your subject matter experts um, who have deep domain knowledge, they, their gut instincts is based on years of experience. Right? Um, and then you also want to have the more sort of rational, maybe wordy, maybe numbers are involved, um, ways to capture people's thoughts, because um, that feels more concrete, um, gives you a way to compare across responses. Um, so what we, what we typically do then is provide a worksheet and a place to take notes that helps guide people, right? Guides them, gives them language to focus on. So um, for, for the instinct part, we'll, we call them gut check cards. So a very brief description of the concept or idea that we're presenting. Ask them, you know, based on your gut reaction, thumbs up, thumbs down, your immediate reaction response. Um, and then there'll be um, more detailed presentations, think, ways of calling out features or differences in the different concepts or ideas, um, and then worksheets to go along with that to capture people's responses. Um, and then you have documented kind of process, right? Um, failure to control feedback. Um, another way to think about this is not controlling for group think, so as if people are sharing out. Um, so we know that crowds can be wise. There's some really interesting experiments or studies looking ha at how a large group of people from all different kinds of backgrounds can often actually come up with better decisions or more accurate judgments than a single domain expert. But you have to be able to aggregate their information and their knowledge um, in a, in a um, controlled manner. So when they're in a group, people tend to be conflict averse. Right? So people don't like to rock the boat, you don't want to say no to other people, you don't want conflict. Um, and when they do that, when it comes to decision making, they, they will avoid critically evaluating ideas. This is the, you know, we, it, we don't, it's, for some reason it's not an innate um, ability to debate in a, in a 
reasonable, I, I don't know, what am I, what am I trying to say? Respectful. In a comfortable manner. Yeah, respectful. But most, m many decision, decisions are made in meetings. Um, so what you want to do is allow for quiet reflection and provide those worksheets for note taking in order to capture the wisdom of the crowd, meaning the individual's responses and avoid group think. Um, and it's really hard to do. It's one of the hardest things to do when you're facilitating a meeting to have the room go quiet and do it on purpose, right? But that time and space is really, really critical for getting, getting the individual inputs out. So give people time to think and reflect and then have them talk and discuss, right? Give them a chance to have their own opinion first um, and then share out. Again, simple things that, you know, I think we all agree are obvious, but getting them all put together um, and in a designed decision-making process that you know, stretches over days, weeks, months, sometimes years, um, that's the tricky thing. It's easy for us to let these details go. So for f facilitating a decision, you want to be sure to set the stage. You want to be sure to get a w uh, provide a, a means of capturing people's instincts and their rationalizations, their rational thought process, and avoid groupthink. And then finally, following through. This is almost the hardest part, if you can get to the decision, right? Is how do you make it stick? So perhaps unsurprisingly, here's that documentation bit again. This is why it was so important early on, right? Failure to document is probably one of the biggest, um, biggest failure modes. So you've got to write down what was decided, as well as why, and you know, also capture kind of the different degrees of, um, of support for that decision. Um, and writing things down increases commitment to the decision. Um, and it establishes a basis to measure the results of the decision. So you have to be explicit um, and transparent. And when we say writing things down increases commitment, we mean it very literally. Um, and I'll get back to that in a sec. So second failure mode is failure to make a commitment. Um, how can we avoid the not made here attitude? You know, I didn't make this decision. Someone handed this decision down to me. You know, I've got other projects to work on. This is not my, this is not my problem. Um, one of the things we, we can do is try to uh, leverage the endowment effect. Um, so the endowment effect is one of these cognitive um, biases, um, which is that people place a greater value on things that they actually own or possess than things that they don't. And so the coffee mug refers to a study um, where people would walk up to, again, undergrads, very popular test subject, and say, hey, here's this coffee mug. How much do you think it's worth? You know, oh, I think it's worth 250. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll give it to you give it to you, right? And then later on, go back to that same undergrad who now, it's their coffee mug and say, hey, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to buy that coffee mug off of you. How, you know, how much do you want to sell it for? And they value it higher because it's, now it's theirs. Well, that's the interpretation anyway of this study. Um, so we want to try and give people a sense of ownership of the decision so they, that they value it and will commit to it moving forward. We left the bullet point off of this. How do we do that? How do you do that? How do you give people ownership over a decision? If, if you had to do it, how would you do it? Well, not Amy, you've done this. Someone else, someone else who doesn't work here. I would make them feel like they got Oh, no, 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 you, you, you've worked here too. Someone who has not worked here. Yes? Well, if they've made a good decision, you praise them. If they've made a good decision, how do you know if a decision is good? Uh, if you're the leader of the is this the leader of the group? The model, the no, this is really the people. No, this is the people down the line. So, you know, our group, our team, we came up with this decision. It's a great decision. Okay, now we, we need to get it implemented. And we're saying, you know, if you give people ownership, a feeling of ownership, they're more likely to be committed and value it and feel like the I'm invested. Right? So it was a connection. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's ownership, and then in addition to that, support them with the resources they need, oh, yeah, yeah. the time to not only do the work, but practice new stuff if yeah. it's involved, yeah. if they don't have the people they need. I mean, so those are the underpinnings of that ownership, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it only goes so far mm -hmm. uh, until they hit the wall, say, we want to do this, but we can't, yeah. because. Yeah, yeah, if it's not supported, it, you know, if they're not taking it seriously and giving me the tools I need, to implement this, then why should I take it seriously? All right. Three, failure to manage confidence. 
All right, so there's a failure mode of not striking the right balance. So this is an interesting one. Individuals are prone to overconfidence, and groups are even more overconfident than individuals. Okay, what does that mean? So there are these studies where um, you know, they give people these, these tests or judgment tests where they have to maybe evaluate something or, or um, estimate um, amounts of something. And then after the test, the individual is asked, okay, how well do you think you did? And people are really, they tend to be overconfident. They think they did better than they actually did. And then when you put them in a group problem solving um, situation where they solve the problem as a group, they're even more confident that they're right, all right, even though they may not actually be right. So overconfidence is bad for a number of reasons um, when it comes to de decision making. First, it discourages the decision maker from improving on the quality of their knowledge. So when they're looking um, at the, spa the solution space, um, if they're overconfident, a lot of times they'll focus on one or two things and that's it. You don't consider all of the possible options. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest pitfalls to overconfidence. However, on the other hand, the more confidence you have in a decision, the more likely you are to actually follow through with it, right? If you're not confident in a decision, why would you carry it out? So we have to try and strike a balance. So what are things that we can do to do that? Um, so again, taking, taking from these psychological studies, there are some really basic things to do. One is make people work for it as a way of controlling for overconfidence. It turns out um, that as the amount of cognitive processing in choice increases, overconfidence decreases. You saw this earlier when we said if you overload people and there's too much cognitive processing going on, they become less confident. Right? So this is, again, going back to this, we have to figure out how to strike the right balance. So make them work for it. This means asking participants explicitly to consider the options from multiple points of view. Again, straightforward, but we don't always force people to do this. Um, th it can be as simple as asking participants to explicitly consider and, and write out the pros as well as the cons for the options. Right? And so there's a reference to one of the studies that looked at the results of um, having to do that task and the confidence in the, in the decision. Um, and then related to that is make your participants write it down. We're giving them worksheets. A lot of times you'll find that people in the group, you know, they'll talk to their neighbors, but they don't actually write it down. The very act of writing it down, the decision or the reason for the decision, actually leads to greater confidence that the right decision was made. Again, from some studies where they look at, you know, groups and their confidence rating after they make these decisions. Really simple, but again, you have to be dis disciplined and prepare for it. And then finally, failure to follow up. Oh, I think this is finally. Um, so lack of alignment, lack of conviction, lack of trust in the validity of the process um, or the outcome um, can make people get decision amnesia. Really? You know, it's easy to forget what was decided. So you really want to be um, good about following up. Schedule a follow-up uh, one or two months out. Um, check in and see, you know, where things may be going poorly um, because that's how you're going to learn, you know, to improve your decision, um, your, your process um, moving forward. Yes, that was the last one. So here's our summary of follow-up and, and what some of the ingredients are for success. Documenting, creating a compelling story, and making sure whoever will be involved next is prepared and involved. Thank you for participating in the conversation and making this a lively event. I really appreciate it.